Good afternoon and welcome to this important conversation on rebuilding child care for a more equitable future in the midst of COVID-19. We are grateful that you've joined us as we endeavor to take advantage of this generational opportunity to redesign and rebuild childcare. Today's conversation features the authors of the essay, Rebuilding the Early Care and Education System with Equity at the Center, which was published last week by Capita, who is hosting today's conversation. Capita is an independent nonprofit startup ideas lab working at the intersection of research, public policy, social innovation, design, and the arts. We explore how the great cultural and social transformations of our day affect young children, and we foster new ideas to ensure a future in which children and their families flourish. I am Megan Cheney, a senior project manager at Open Fields, which is a social impact consulting firm which incubated Capita and now works every day helping to translate Capita's insights into actionable strategies for organizations, policymakers, investors, and program leaders. Capita and Bank Street College of Education are two organizations tied together by a singular commitment to the flourishing of children and families now and for future generations. Bank Street College of Education is a recognized leader in early childhood education, teacher and leader preparation, and the development of innovative practice in school systems across the country. For 100 years, Bank Street's focus has been on improving the education of children and their teachers by applying to the education process all available knowledge about learning and growth and by connecting teaching and learning meaningfully to the outside world. So we're excited to have all four authors of the essay with us today. And we have prepared some questions to get the conversation started, and then we will open it up to questions from our viewers. You can submit those questions starting at any time using the chat and YouTube Live. So without any further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce you to the authors. Authors, if you will just give us a little wave as I introduce you so that people can put a face with your name. So first we have Brandy Jones Lawrence. Brandy is the Senior Director of the Zero to Three Policy, Communications, and Partnership at Bank Street. She is a seasoned early childhood policy and advocacy leader who has worked on behalf of needs of low-income, high-potential families with very young children at the state and national levels, at the Ounce of Prevention Fund, and in the philanthropic sector at JB and MK Pritzker Family Foundation. Emily Sherrick is the Associate Vice President at Bank Street's Education Center and co-author of the Investing in the Birth to Three Workforce White Paper. Annie Schaefing is the Director of New Program Design at Bank Street Education Center and previously led Early Childhood Workforce Development at the DC Office of the State Superintendent of Education, focusing on credential support, professional development, and compensation. And last but not least, we have Courtney Parkerson, who is a consultant for Bank Street Education Center, working on early childhood initiatives and a co-author of Investing in the Birth to Three Workforce White Paper. So now that you have met the team, let's dive right in. So to get us started, why this paper now? Well, I, I think we can find ourselves in a unique moment People are focused on two things, really, the essential nature of childcare as a result of the pandemic. And also there's a heightened awareness and I think compulsion to act to address systemic racism that's consumed the experiences of black and brown Americans. I think that the, as an early education field, we have to take do our fair share of reflecting back and looking inward at the contributions that we've made to the inequalities in our early care and education system. Intentionally or not for decades, we've marginalized and undervalued the workforce that is largely black and brown women who provide the early care and education in this country and who predominantly provide this care for infants and toddlers. This is not insignificant for hundreds of years now we've undervalued this kind of work that's been named women's work. And that fact becomes even more acute when we look at black and brown caregivers dating back to the days of slavery and wet nurses to the current day situation where we are undervaluing them through compensation and through their contributions and funds of knowledge that they bring to the work. 
when we have 86% of the early care and education field making $15 or uh, per hour or less, and 40% of that workforce experiencing or having to enroll in public assistance, we have a problem. And so we have to have a fundamental conversation around the inequities in our own system and addressing them, especially at this moment when we have an opportunity to redesign and undo some things that we've already done. When we look at black and brown providers, that situation I just explained gets even worse. They're only making 84 cents on the dollar of their white peers and that, that extends to whatever uh, level of credential you have. So there's no better time I think right now than to have a conversation about this and reflect because everybody's talking about um, taking an interest in redesigning. And I use the word redesigning particularly because I think it's different than rebuilding. Redesigning to me says we take account of what we've looked, what we've done in the past and actually look at the way that we have designed the system to be inequitable and sort of remediate and address that in any new designs and be and have that be the driver for new designs. So that's my mindset as I head into I headed into you know co-authoring this with my partners. And I think that's why this moment is now um, to take this opportunity and frankly this responsibility when we're looking down the nose of losing almost half of the capacity of our childcare industry. We have to do something differently that supports both the families and children and the caregivers who provide that early care and education. Absolutely, I just wanna jump in here. Um, another reason our team at Bank Street felt it was important to bring our voices to the dialogue right now um, is because we see some very real risks ahead of us as we respond to and engage in that work of rebuilding or as uh, Brandy described, redesign. I think the good news is that childcare is on Americans' minds right now in ways that it really hasn't been before. Everyone understands how critical childcare is to opening and reopening our economy, which is incredible. Um, just a few months ago, six months in January, when we released our white paper, uh, we spent considerable time and energy talking with our colleagues about how to shore up the public will for investments in childcare, how to get childcare on the radar, and now it is. So this awareness, in fact, could be a kind of silver lining for childcare, but only if we capitalize on the moment to ask for what we really need to support high quality childcare and education. I think as we have these conversations about rebuilding, we have to do a better job of centering child development in the conversations. We need to talk about childcare not just as an economic tool that allows parents to go to work, uh, which is critically important, but it's just not the whole story. Like it or not, children are going to hit critical milestones during the pandemic. And if we don't think seriously about how we're supporting them and their caregivers through what's very traumatic for many families, children's healthy development is going to be at risk long-term. And we have to take that into consideration as we're doing this work of rebuilding. I think as a field, we have to talk about the benefits of developmentally meaningful early learning experiences. We have to talk about the brain research and we have to talk about how childcare can set um, children on the right path for future learning. My biggest fear is that we will be successful in generating new revenue right now, but we will be successful in scaling potentially poor or mediocre quality care. And I think we can't invest in more of the same. We can't invest in just um, putting a Band-Aid on um, our current situation. We have to look at this, as Brandy said, from an equity perspective. Only 10% of our country's childcare is considered high quality right now. And those, um, those issues are ones we can't ignore. And if we fail to act on this point, I think we run a real risk of further deepening the divides that already exist. And it could have a detrimental impact on kids, families, and frankly, I think would also make it very hard for us as a field to advocate for anything more in the future. Wow, yeah, so many good points there, Emily and Brandy. Thank you for just getting us started there, man. A lot, a lot to chew on and we'll dig in throughout the conversation today. So that's a really good segue into the first proposal that you present in um, the essay. 
And so Annie, could you tell us a little bit more about the first recommendation, which is to support provider mental health and trauma-informed care? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so our first recommendation is that, as Emily alluded to, we need to focus on child development during this time and not just physical safety. So there's been a real push lately in finding enough gloves and hand sanitizer and soap and masks to enable people to reopen, um, which is of course very important. But at the same time, young children are rapidly developing right now. And so we need to ensure that teachers are able to give them supportive, responsive care, especially during this unprecedented time when so many families and children are under such stress. So I think there's a real opportunity here to provide meaningful professional development um, some ideas that we have at Bank Street are to do this through a sustained cohort model that allow teachers to learn content really deeply, but then also enables them to connect and be in community with one another. It's really important that we tend to children's social emotional needs at this time as well. And one way to do this is through focusing on uh, training teachers on trauma informed care. And then beyond this, we also need to really make sure that providers have the tools to take care of their own mental health so that they're, again, equipped to kind of show up as their best selves as they're providing care for our youngest children. Absolutely. And I, I think any time we talk about designing professional learning experiences for early childhood educators, we need to make sure that it's developed in an accessible format. So offered at times and locations that are convenient and accessible through this pandemic, you know, developing high quality online and engaging learning opportunities. Um, and then I also think that we really need to think about compensating educators for their time pursuing professional learning experiences. This shows educators that we value their time. And particularly with early childhood educators, K-12 teachers are often paid for professional development. Um, and it's time that we do the same thing for our early childhood educators as well. We recommend in our essay, you know, paying educators stipends for attending professional learning. And I think that's a really important thing to consider. Yeah, so some of the things that you just said, Courtney, really brings to mind another recommendation from the essay, which is equipping providers as educators. Um, so could another team member sort of speak to what you mean by that? Yeah, um, so we discuss in the essay the need to in invest in really robust models for both pre-service and in-service professional learning. These long-term professional learning opportunities also need to result either in college credits that can be applied to a meaningful degree or in hours that can be applied to a credential. Um, the important thing really is that this time teachers are spending in learning leads to concrete, tangible professional outcomes. We don't want them just piling up with professional learning hours that don't lead to anything. Um, I feel very lucky to be at Bank Street. Bank Street has a history of supporting adult learners and teachers um, in a way that really affects true change in their practice. And we deeply believe that adults and teachers are the most important part of the equation uh, when it comes to providing responsive childcare. So we really believe that right now the childcare system needs to support our teachers in doing this complex work, especially given the midst of everything uh, we're in right now. Yes, and, and central to the recommendations that we make in our essay are Bank Street's belief about educator preparation. Um, you know, it's essential that educators, uh, both those that exist in the field currently and those that are aspiring to enter the field, uh, have access to the kinds of learning experiences that are, are truly meaningful. So they have the opportunity to apply coursework and theory and research to practice, um, that there's time and space for self-reflection through the guidance of a, an experienced educator or coach. Uh, it's also really important that educators have the opportunity to meet with their peers and collaborate and share problems of practice um, and support each other in a network. Uh, competencies and um, strengths-based approaches to uh, professional learning are also really important. They give experienced educators the opportunity to you know, demonstrate and build on the knowledge that they, they bring to the work. Um, and so it's these kinds of integrated learning experiences that enable educators to demonstrate their skills, you know, in context that we feel are really important instead of the kind of, you know, other kinds of standardized assessments. 
um, which is one of the reasons why, you know, in our in our white paper, we describe uh, residency programs or apprenticeship like approaches to preparing uh, educators, uh, specifically in the early childhood space. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I would just add that um, I think to this point, the lack of investment in professional learning opportunities in many ways reflects the reality that in our country, we don't view the work of caring for young children as education. Um, many people still view caregivers as babysitters. Um, and as a result, we just see this work as feeding, diapering, putting down for a nap. Um, but of course, we in the field know that these everyday moments are really critical learning opportunities that build the foundation from which all future learning and development happen. So it's really critical that um, caregivers have the, the language and the skills to help children kind of through these experiences and to capitalize on those moments. Um, but right now we allocate very few public resources to developing that unique skill set that early childhood educators need um, so that they can effectively engage young children in really developmentally meaningful experiences. And then I also just want to raise the really critical point that as we expand these opportunities for professional learning and earning meaningful credentials, we must also develop the opportunity to actually earn increased compensation. Yeah, that's another thing that you all talk about in the essay. Um, so Brandy, I'm wondering about how that sort of plays into the proposal in the essay for pay parity for infant and toddler teachers with K-12 and even preschool educators. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, on the uh, while we have to absolutely support teachers to have the kind of professional development and credentials that they need to be effective teachers and educators and, and caregivers, we can't be, keep asking more of this workforce without giving them something that's real change. And if we underinvest in pre professional development, we even more un underinvest in compensation for the work that they're doing. I think that the North Star needs to be achieving pay parity. We say that in the paper that's comparable in both benefits and compensation with elementary school teachers that are similarly credentialed. For far too long, you know, we've had to accept in some ways we've accepted marginal and incremental change um, and investment in early childhood um, systems. And frankly, none of it has really ever gone towards compensation. And so what we've ended up with is an early childhood system that's basically subsidized by the families and children and the caregivers. And that to me is the burden is misplaced. Um, we are offering the caregivers poverty wages and that to me is a subsidy for the cost of the care that they're providing. So even within the zero to five workforce, which is what you were talking about is a, is a disparity both between infant and toddler caregivers or primary infant and toddler caregivers and their preschool counterparts. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, in reference to uh, caregivers of color and the disparities in their compensation um, against their white counterparts. So as I said, we're putting the burden in the wrong place in this system. And of course we know the paying for all of this is not easy. Um, childcare costs are more expensive than a mortgage in 34 states in this country. So I don't wanna say, and I, and I do wanna say this, I do wanna say that uh, wage supplements and tax credits, those kinds of wins have been very hard won and have been greatly needed. And, you know, I really applaud those efforts of those supplemental income relief um, that we've had for the early ch childhood system. However, we know from lots of reports, including the one from the National Academy of Sciences, the financing report, that those kinds of wage supplements are not sustainable income. They, they don't allow people to make <laughs> decisions about their life and their families um, be, um, because they're not predictable. And I, you know, I like sometimes refer to them as birthday checks and, and bake sales, right? So <laughs> I think we have to, you know, treat this workforce as the professionals that they are. And we have to start rec uh, figuring out how we compensate them with the funds that we have. Yeah, if I could jump in, Brandy, I, I think it's really yeah. important to note that we cannot achieve this compensation piece without significant public investment at all le levels of the system, federal, state, and local. 
Um, you know, I think we've started to see some progress in terms of pay parity for preschool teachers with their, their elementary school counterparts in states that have decided to invest uh, publicly in, in preschool. And, you know, in some ways it feels to me that we're like right now making an arbitrary distinction to begin investing in the education of children starting at age four. Um, when we know from, you know, brain research that it would really benefit um, you know, everyone to, to start investing earlier and, you know, the, the returns and the, um, you know, what it means for children uh, could really be significant if we start this public investment earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to add, I was actually working in DC um, when that birth to three for all DC act was passed in 2018. Um, if you're not familiar with the act, it's a really comprehensive one. Um, and it actually includes an effort to bring childcare workers to parity with elementary school teachers in both pay and in benefits. Um, but in DC, as in many places, you know, currently there's a staggering difference between childcare wages and elementary school teacher wages, and perhaps even more pronounced in DC because um, there they have some of the highest paid K to 12 teachers in the country. Um, but there really is this substantial need for public investment and really creative strategic thinking to make pay parity a reality. Um, I know the, the office of the chief financial officer in DC said that, that would take around $64 million a year in subsidy increase to pay for, pay for parity compensation um, in DC. And council members suggested several different ways to pay for it, such as legalizing sports betting and increasing the tobacco tax as potential ways to pay for the act. Um, even with these suggestions, revenue was still and is still a stumbling block in implementing all of Birth to Three for All DC. Um, however, obviously compensation remains a really urgent issue. Um, it's a matter of racial justice, as Brandy was speaking to. It's a matter of gender equity. Um, and I'm encouraged that DC got that far even before this moment. So even before all of this public will that we've been seeing lately, DC was able to pass that really comprehensive act. And it's of course a credit to the very strong advocates that are in DC. Um, but to me, that is, is really hopeful. The fact that we were able to get there then, um, it, you know, bodes well for what I think we can, can do now to invest in childcare. Great. Um, so we, we have a question um, already coming in from the audience. Um, so that question is, how can we make sure that equitable professional development and adult learning is happening equitably through our community? Well, it looks like somebody retracted that question actually, not sure why, but more coming in. So let's, let's hop to the next one. I'm not, not sure why that one was retracted, but um, so the next one we have is, how can we best support these initiatives in our communities, states, and country? What are your recommendations for immediate actions that we can take? Um, so regarding immediate action, something that we've been thinking about at Bank Street is um, the urgent need to really support family child care providers in this moment. So we know that many children are already in family child care. Enrollment numbers are likely to continue to grow given that they're able to have smaller group sizes um, than centers. And I think recovery from COVID-19 will likely really depend on that group of caregivers. Um, unfortunately, right now they're, they're under-resourced, under-supported, right? Um, and they're also over-represented among the infant toddler caregiving landscape. So one thing um, we'd love to do at Bank Street and I think other folks can do as well is develop nice, flexible online professional development learning opportunities that um, support family child care providers and then also offer them that opportunity to connect with one another, which is something uh, we talked about earlier. I, I also want to um, jump in to talk about um, capacity building for our early childhood system and leadership. I think this is another piece that we can start to attend to right away. Um, you know, it's always been true, but especially during this moment of the pandemic, we're asking um, people to solve even more complex problems than ever before, especially at a state um, or local level where they're trying to manage the tremendous stress that everybody's under to run childcare in a moment like right now. Um, 
And I think our, our system needs strong leadership, policy level leadership to navigate through these kinds of times. And folks don't always have an opportunity to receive uh, the kind of training uh, to do that large scale design and systems change work that's really needed. Um, so I think we need to think at a local level, at a state level, at a national level about how to um, support our leadership and our systems leadership um, to be able to do this kind of work. Um, and I think as we do that, we also need to come back to where we started this conversation is to think about equity and to providing those opportunities for the folks um, from the communities that our programs serve um, and to think about racial diversity. I mean, today we're you know, painfully aware that this panel includes three white women and we have to change that picture. Yeah, so another, another question from the audience, kind of tagging on to what you were just speaking about. Um, what strategies can increase the recruitment of diversity in early childhood development instructors, coaches, presenters, and technical assistance providers? So what strategies can increase the recruitment of diversity? Well, one of the, the strategies that we discuss in our essay um, is this uh, grow your own approach to uh, educator preparation, which is uh, an approach that's had success in the K through 12 level and is starting to, um, you know, be practiced by some early childhood programs. I think um, Head Start is, is one example. Um, but essentially, it's, it's where um, educators or, you know, teachers are recruited from within a community, possibly even parents of children that are being served um, in the child care programs and receive access to professional development and uh, a chance to earn uh, teaching credentials. Um, and then they're employed by that program or other programs in the community. Um, and I think it's one way to, you know, ensure that the um, funds of knowledge that come through cultural and racial diversity within our programs um, uh, are valued and, um, you know, come through. And I would add to that to say that I think high school CTE programs in early childhood education are another way to um, really build those school, those skills within the community. Um, but again, I do think this goes back to compensation because um, when I was in BC, I had the pleasure of leading one of these CTE programs. And um, I know a lot of the, the young women and men that were in that program were seeing that they could make just as much money um, working any other job, you know? So I think it's, it's hard to bring anyone into the field and it's hard to bring diversity into the field when there are other um, opportunities that pay the same or, or more. So we really need to focus on that compensation piece again. Yeah. I Oh, sorry, I just wanted to jump in real quick and say that that's so important because I think it's, you know, we're, we're talking about redesigning and undesigning things that were inequitable from the start. And so we can't offer uh, communities of color and lived experience um, representatives an, a, a viable opportunity to have a living wage and a profession that will support them and their families. That's, to me, sort of a double do a double down on the racism that we've already that they're already experiencing because I'm not going to promote that. Um, and so it's hard to do that recruiting effort at this moment. And that's why, as Annie was saying, the compensation piece is so critical that we get it right this time and we get it right from the start and it's built in from the beginning because that it's just the only way to offer an honest and um, credible profession to folks as we want to diversify. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. So, you know, I think we're, we're getting a lot of questions about, you know, how do we do this strategies, ideas, people kind of looking for that kind of there, there. And so are there, you know, things that you all are doing at Bank Street right now to contribute and respond to the needs that we've already been talking about today? I mean, sure. Oh, go ahead, Brandy. Just a really quick. I mean, I think we have to, similar to things I've been saying before, I think we have to really deci decide that human capital is an input that's the most important thing we have, that's the most important one, and frankly, in the equation of getting children ready and prepared for school and life. And, and so that's 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 the expense of the, of the endeavor. And so we have to build contracts and subsidy rates that account for that 
asset that we need to have going into every, you know, the endeavor of educating children. And so, you know, I think we have to think differently about set asides or, you know, where, how money is allocated and like requiring components of our existing system and whatever we redesign to have an, in contemplation of, of compensation. And I also think it's going to take different people at the table to help us understand how our marketplace works. It's not, you know, differently than others. And, um, and using the levers of that marketplace to supply uh, the adequate level of compensation to keep it sustained. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Emily. Oh, no, not at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I sort of think about it in phases. So I think immediately we need to build off the emergency response in ways that Annie talked about earlier, providing um, support right now to providers who are typically very isolated, trying to figure things out on their own. Some of our colleagues at Bank Street have done interviews and surveys of providers, and they're working you know, in a vacuum without information and guidance, making the best decisions that they can for, children's and, for children and families. They need support right now. And as we talked about earlier, I think they, they need support to figure out how to keep folks safe, how to stay open, but they also need support to manage their own experiences of trauma and those of their families and children in their, in their programs. Um, I mean, I speak from my own experience. My children's providers and early childhood educators were often my first stop, right? And I think a lot of families um, will turn to their child care providers for support right now. And we need to figure out how to get them um, training uh, to manage their own experiences of trauma and those of the families they're working with. And then I think the next phase is to start moving towards some of the more bold initiatives that we have known for a long time we need to bring into the field. So at Bank Street, we are really interested in, in supporting communities that want to invest in robust professional learning that's tied to compensation increases. We think that combination is the key to improving quality and we want to elevate that point right now when we have this opportunity and this window open. And then longer term, but I think we have to start thinking about this as a field right now, and I know folks are at the table doing that, is the kind of um, initiatives that Brandy started talking about. We have to look at ideas that we have been, frankly, maybe too afraid to ask for before. We need to think not about incremental change. We need to think about what's actually needed to develop quality access to real childcare options for all families. This is our moment. It's hard because we're also managing so much stress right now in our systems, but we have to take advantage of this moment to try and think about something bigger. We are very excited to partner with our colleagues in organizations across the field to think about what those things are. We're putting our ideas out today that we have, but we know it's going to require a lot of collaboration to figure out those right answers. And I think that's ultimately um, the call to action that we're trying to make. Yeah, so to that point, um, one person just asked, you know, if you could talk about, if you're aware of, can talk about kind of other countries' models of publicly funded birth to 12 education systems. Courtney, do you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I think that there are, um, you know, several examples of, um, uh, you know, Quebec is one um, region of the world that um, significantly funds uh, care and education for children um, starting from birth. Um, uh, you know, there are uh, um, I'm trying to think of other examples that come to mind. Brandy, do you have any other ideas? Of There's one that, yeah, I was, I think it's maybe the same thing in Quebec that, that I just recently was on a webinar for, for 10, like, is it the $10 for the first 10 or something like that? And, and within it, it's a whole initiative about, you know, increasing the investment in early childhood education. And there's just like a, a, I think a flat tax, but within it, there are requirements for the base pay of, of the early childhood and education workforce. So, um, you know, I think it's hard to compare ourselves to other countries for many, many reasons. Um, but one of which would be just the capital, the, just the, the, the capitalist market. I mean, it's hard to compare us to places that have more socialist values. 
um, in, embedded in, in, their, in the infrastructure that they have. I mean, folks are just baseline, you know, sort of used to having a certain level of taxing, but they're also used to having two years of paid leave when they have a baby and universal health care. And so there's, it's just sometimes I, I find those, it's inspiring and it makes me want to get on a plane when it's not COVID and move somewhere else. But at the moment, that's not the environment in, or the infrastructure we've built in this country. So I think um, there's good design um, good design guidelines, um, but I think it's hard to um, sort of pick up and drop into our very convoluted system. And then you add the whole thing of state, uh, you know, if you've met one early childhood system, you've met one early childhood system, right? <laughs> um, yeah. at, in, in the, out of 50. So the one other example I, I just came to mind is, um, you know, Finland is a, a place that, uh, in terms of investment in the the workforce, that I think is, you yeah. know, as an example, um, you know, both in terms of how they they train their educators uh, before they enter the field, and then even the kind of like professional learning and support and um, you know emphasis on child development and self reflection and self assessment as opposed to a kind of um, you know strict uh, uh, standardized assessment type uh, approach to assessing educator effectiveness. Um, so that's another place I'd, I'd cite in terms of like investing in, in the workforce, which in turn leads to, you know, quality. That one's an interesting example too, because of their emphasis on outdoor education. So I think it's also interesting to look at what other countries um, have focused on in terms of their definitions of quality. And I think there's places we can really learn from as well in that regard. I would say another piece that always strikes me as I, as we, as I sort of learn about what's happening in other countries is this, this um, less tangible um, value that folks have on early childhood education. And I think that undergirds a lot of what we're talking about here today is right. Americans not historically having valued this kind of work. And that shows up in a lot of the ways we've talked about compensation and lack of investment in professional learning and seeing this as a profession. Um, that's a choice we've made. And again, I think the narrative is changing as parents are home with their children and seeing more close up um, their development. And then frankly, also, you know, we've all seen posts on social media thanking teachers for all they do in ways that I'm not sure Americans have, have really um, understood or sort of spoken about en masse um, in recent memory. What I do think we have to, it's similar, I think, uh, you know, what I do think we have to, you know, take what we could apply from other countries and just, just from a different mentality, the mentality that's out there now, is that, you know, I think the future is not in increasing CCDBG in incremental and marginal ways. <laughs> you know, we have to figure out how we embed this public good and fund it that way by embedding it in the federal, state, and local fabric, financial fabric of how we deliver public goods like K-12 education. We've somehow figured it out for them. And Obviously, I know that that's not ideal in, um, in terms of they're still underfunded as well, but um, it's certainly a bigger, you know, a better and more effective in a closer way from A to B than what we've got right now. Um, again, it just can't be um, these marginal increases anymore, not only for the compensation piece, but just for the system as a whole, as we, you know, sort of have to rebuild and redesign. Um, something better and, and quality from the beginning. Great. So say that ECE wa funding was increased, um, and this is a question from the audience. Um, you know, what do you see as the most pressing investment that we would start with if there, if there was an increase in funding? Would it be leadership or professional development, pay parity? What do you see as kind of the most impactful uh, first investments? I can start, um, but I'm interested in what my colleagues think, so I um, would love other folks to jump in. Um, I think I would start with this combination I talked about earlier of really robust professional learning that's tied to compensation. Um, 
we have talked about this a lot in the white paper and in our publications, but we really see that as the, as the lever for quality. I think it's hard, um, it's hard to carve out the dollars that we need for compensation. And I think we all acknowledge that. I think I would like to see us um, move that forward. If we had a, a lot of additional resources come in, I would start with that. I think it would help us um, attract folks to the field. As someone asked earlier, I think it would help us retain folks in the field. I think it would help elevate the value we place on early care and education. And it would create um, a better market for credentialing programs that I think are essential to, to shoring up the quality. Um, so I think that's where I would start. It, it's a great question and it's a hard one because there are so many other needs and priorities uh, when you think about all that children and families need. Um, but I think that would be the, the, the biggest lever to pull right now. Yeah, I'll just chime in. You know, Brandy mentioned um, in her, her remarks uh, previously the importance of paid family leave, which is, I think, a, a really close third to the, the two that Emily just outlined. Um, you know, ensuring that families have the time and space that they need to adjust to their new life when they welcome a child and, um, you know, to really fill that critical role as uh, the first teacher of their child. Um, it's so important. And it's something that we saw, you know, was another huge need that was brought to the table in light of this pandemic. You know, paid family leave was one of the first, uh, included in one of the first stimulus packages. Um, the reality is, though, at some point in this country, predominantly, most American families have both parents return to work and their children need to go somewhere and their children deserve to go somewhere that's high quality. And so, you know, um, paid family leave alone is not going to address this uh, situation that we're describing, which is why investment in professional learning and compensation is something that really needs to be invested in. Yeah, I, I'll very quickly give my response, which um, would also be compensation. Um, but I think because if you are worried about putting food on the table or um, you know trying to take care of your own children's needs, you're not going to be able to really focus on the kids in your classroom and um, the babies in your care. And so, I don't know. I think I think from my perspective, it's a quick way to to improve quality just because suddenly everything. Um, you know, feels feels a little more, a little bit more secure. And of course, I agree with my with my colleagues, which is why we wrote the paper together. I think, um, but I do. You know, I think. Well, I totally recognize. Look, I haven't. I'm not not so naive as to think that you know the the question isn't valid in the sense that we have existed in a in a realm of scarcity since I since the beginning of my career in early childhood. Um, but I think the question can can no longer be what do we what can we do first. It has to be we have to do it all at the same time. That's that's what I mean when I think about the redesign mindset. Mm -hmm. We cannot design a new system in a mindset of scarcity again, because that's insanity, right? We're going to do the same thing and expect a different result. We cannot do that anymore. And so, um, I think we have to really reprogram ourselves, and myself included to not let all of those thoughts of like, but how, but when, you know, but like, there's no question what we have to do first. We have to do it all at the same time. And I don't think we've had any other moment in time where we have actually the potential to make that be, um, have a sh be, have shared public will around that idea um, than now based on where we started, which is all of the racial undertones and unequitable um, practices that have, that sort of this particular piece of the system represents and for the children and for the workforce, as well as just the need, um, the just heightened awareness around the need for childcare and, and frankly, the extended amount of time that we're going to have to grapple with who is taking care of our children, what are they getting and, and what, what do they need um, and, and that comes down to the human capital. And so it has to be both compensation and training. It has to be. I want to just jump in um, to underscore um, Courtney's point, because I think it's a great one. And, and I think the, it also harks back to another question you asked earlier, Megan, 
around what other things can we do right now. Parents are home with their kids um, who are not in childcare, right? So there's a lot of a lot of children that are still in childcare, a lot of children who need to go back to childcare, and there's a lot of children home with their parents right now. And I think we have an opportunity in that to provide some more intentional support to parents around how to support their children, um, their children's development right now. I think that would have an immediate impact on the lives of children and families, but I think it could also have a longer term impact on helping parents understand what quality means, what to look for in a child care program, and I think would further fuel this increased public will that we have right now around the importance of early care and education. Um, so I think that's another piece we need to think about. I mean, I can speak for myself as a parent. I'm just the onslaught of resources and materials that are not well curated, that put pressure on me as a parent in ways I can't manage while I'm trying to work. We need something more thoughtful and targeted and supportive for parents right now um, to address what I mentioned you know, at the beginning of this call, which is that children are developing now in this period um, and, and that those periods of development happen quickly and we're going to be in this pandemic for quite some time. So I think that's another missed opportunity if we don't attend to doing some really direct outreach to parents. And, and Courtney, you made me think of it too, because you know, new parents um, uh, right now have even less support than ever before. They can't have their family with them. They don't have their usual support networks. And so I think we really need to think about what those first days, weeks, and years look like right now as well and be creative about those um, supports. Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic has entirely shifted the, the prenatal experience for most women and then their birthing experiences and then this you know, postpartum period. So um, it's, it's definitely worth reflecting on um, you know, those experiences and the kinds of supports that those families need now. You know, another area that I think, you know, we didn't cover as intimately in the paper, but in the essay, but I, I think about this on a daily basis as well as what about those families with children who have IEPs and special needs and the, and the ability to get those kinds of um, supports and services from the, the workforce that supports those children through an, you know, either a very stressed or, um, just different like delivery system, whether it be in person or virtually, which I'm not even sure how that looks, but it just, it just, there's a million different ways that we can all like sort of lead back to the truth that like the caregivers and the educators and the equation have to have the skills that they need to be able to adapt, pivot and adjust to the complex environment that we find ourselves in. And so um, again, I just don't see how we can't not, how we, can think of doing anything else but supporting them and getting them those that sort of toolbox they need um, at this time. Yes, I think that y'all have really been touching on this. We, we had a question from the audience about how family, friend, and neighbor care really fits into um, the recommendations that you've made and kind of the, the things that we've been talking about today. Anything you would add to that? I feel like I'm dominating it. I'll just say that I, you know, I think we make it clear in the paper that family, friend, and neighbor care is is quite possibly, you know, on the on the rise, um, you know, at this moment, uh, given the experience of families of co with COVID, uh, with the COVID pandemic. I mean, um, and you know, I think on top of that, you know, I think family, friend, and neighbor care is <laughs> is often the only affordable opportunity, but I also think it's sometimes the safest opportunity and families feel very, very, um, you know, are, are making that as a conscious decision, not just about affordability, but about the protection of their children to be cared for by somebody who loves and respects them um, and treats them um, with kindness. And so um, you're more likely to get that from someone you know um, and who loves your child and who is a family member. And so I think, you know, this, current climate that we find ourselves in, even though um, we have, I think, a growing, swelling group of folks who want to do something differently um, and change the, the narrative around that, we also have um, higher exposure to folks 
who want to uh, perpetuate inequality. And so protecting our children um, in the arms um, and, and homes of our family, friends, and neighbor care is, is important. And we need to support those children and those, and those caregivers in any way that makes sense for them um, to feel successful and to feel um, just to feel confident that they're doing the best they can for the children that they love so much. Yeah, and a couple of the things we mentioned in the essay as well are, um, as Brandy alluded to, kind of finding ways to support those folks, whether that's through home visiting, where we have um, people coming out just to kind of help make sure they're implementing back best practice or give them the tools to be able to do so. Um, and then another idea we had is more around like play group opportunities so that those family, friend and neighbor caregivers can come together with other FFN caregivers um, to you know share experiences together, learn together in a way that's maybe a bit more informal and approachable. Um, and again, kind of gives them the tools to provide the best quality care that they can. I think one, um... One other sort of silver lining from the pandemic is that um, we're thinking more creatively about how to use remote opportunities. Um, and one of the biggest challenges with, you know, reaching family, friend, and neighbor providers is finding them and um, providing them with linkages to the kind of supports that Annie and Brandy described. So I think we could think more creatively about how to leverage, um, you know, everyone's going on to Zoom, everyone's going online in new ways um, that they may not have before. Folks are using social media. Um, many folks now have phones. So how can we um, think more creatively about remote ways um, and through obviously trusted networks to reach family, friend and neighbor providers? Um, I know um, at Bank Street, we are bringing many of our programs that we would never have thought about doing online into a remote space. Um, and Annie mentioned play groups. I know there's been some folks um, uh, practicing and, and playing around with how to bring some of those play group experiences online. Um, and as we open, you know, bringing a couple of families together as possible, right? So there might be ways to sort of do that in new and creative ways. Um, but I think um, reaching that group is essential um, and always has been. So many children are in that kind of care. And as Brandy said, I think that's only going to increase with the pandemic. Yeah, so one more big question from the audience here before we start to wrap it up, which is um, really about childcare co-ops and wondering if, you know, childcare co-ops could be kind of an infrastructure for what Brandy's been talking about, that kind of everything at once. It can't continue to be these incremental changes, but we really need to go kind of all in on making um, these, these big changes all at once. Are childcare co-ops potentially an infrastructure that could really support that type of a redesign? In your opinion. <laughs> I, I'm certainly not an expert in co-ops, but I, I can throw out a few thoughts um, and welcome my colleagues to jump in if you have other ideas. I mean, I, I think where um, a couple of things stand out to me as we think about the idea of co-ops. One is around just this idea of empowerment and um, having the folks that are doing the work leading the work. And that's very attractive to me as we think about um, valuing our caregivers, all of the, the experience that they bring to the work as, as Brandy talked about earlier, the funds of knowledge. Um, and I think that it, it, it's a powerful structure for also thinking about bringing parents further into um, childcare and what that means and creating fail, uh, sort of community solutions, which I think, again, the pandemic creates an opportunity for us to think creatively and locally. And I think that's a really exciting model from that perspective. The other place where it could, has potential is around, you know, um, the financing piece. Um, you know, I don't think co-ops are going to solve the market failure issues that we've talked about, um, but they could provide one source of pressure relief. I mean, we've seen um, the value of things like shared service models and a co-op of family child care providers coming together, for example, could provide the kind of networking that um, shared services um, offers, and that could reduce costs. And those, you know, if we do it right, any reduced cost could increase compensation. 
So, you know, one way to think about the compensation is through large additional uh, government investment, which we've talked about. The other way to tackle it is obviously by looking at all of the different ways we can move the resources that exist into compensation. And so if you think of co-ops as potentially one strategy for reducing costs or reorganizing how we use resources, um, that's very powerful. And yet I think the dollars are so limited in this market right now that I'm not sure how far that will go, but I think um, it has a lot of potential and is an exciting example of the sort of creative, creative thinking that we all need to be doing right now. It kind of ties in with um, an idea that you've batted around a little bit, Emily, about um, tying that kind of maybe approach with home ownership for, uh, for uh, FCC providers. So, you know, in that kind of co-op model, then perhaps there's a way for, you know, sort of to have a two gen situation going on where we've already talked about sort of who the workforce is and where they're at um, in terms of, of pay. And so um, offering the business as an opportunity to home, to own a home um, in, in maybe a cooperative, you know, approach sounds like an interesting, and as and Emily said, quite innovative idea. Great. So we, in our last few minutes here, we want to ask each of you um, a final question that we ask on all of our kind of capita conversations as a closing question. And that question is, what is one project you've dreamed about, but you haven't started yet? So we'll start with you, Courtney. Sure. Um, so as a mom of three young kids, um, I've uh, spent a lot of time in children's literature and reading books, especially through this pandemic. And I've always been passionate about the way we engage children in literature and view the child through literature. So I would love to um, invest in or become involved with a fellowship that supports aspiring um, children's authors and illustrators. Um, and just one other plug, I think that this is these are um, creators who have really um, engaged in this pandemic in and in, in sort of delivered really powerful and engaging content for children, um, you know, online and through creating videos. And I'd love to think about how we could further their reach um, into classrooms, uh, you know, once children are able to return to school. Okay. Annie, what about you? Yeah. Um, I am really interested in forest preschools um, and the power that exists in, in connecting young children with nature. Um, I think right now during COVID perhaps, this could be a particularly interesting time to pursue that because um, of kind of what we know about being outside being a little bit safer in terms of transmission. Um, but I also believe that the exposure to nature can help uh, with raising adults who really care about the climate change issue that we're facing. Um, but it also provides a really immediate kind of healing experience for children, especially children um, who have experienced trauma. So I think we as an early childhood community could also stand to think about ways we can make nature more accessible to our young children, both within their communities and outside of their communities. And that is work that I would love to do one day. Brandy, what's your dream? Um, so my dream um, is very tied as well, like Courtney, um, to being a mother um, and being a mother of, of and a person of color. Um, I have three children. I have two boys and a girl. And um, I'd like to see more research informed and intentionality um, and frankly differentiated um, approaches to how we support the, the, the social emotional development and healthy development of little black boys in this country. Um, they, they experience a unique kind of racism as public enemy number one. And I think that it is high time that we actually have an intentional strategy for them because it is a real, it's a reality, like I said, a very unique reality to be in that profile of this country. All right, Emily, bring us home. Well, I think mine is definitely more of a dream than a, than a project. Um, I, I, dr I really do dream of a day when early care and education um, is an integral part of how we think about education as Americans. And when we as a nation decide to really invest in all children from birth. 
And I think our best bet that admittedly is full of potential pitfalls, and I'm probably wise to be mentioning this at the end of our webinar, um, because I'm sure it will generate a lot of questions, um, is to think about a financing system that makes school systems responsible for early care and education. Um, it would have to be designed in ways that elevate uh, the quality of early childhood education, um, K to grade two, so that it's more developmentally appropriate, kindergarten, first, second grade. I think we are largely missing out on the power of early years, both through a lack of investment in early childhood and also, uh, frankly, some developmentally inappropriate um, early uh, elementary education. Annie mentioned forest schools. I think we have to really look at what works for young children and double down on those approaches. Um, but we have to build early care and education into a more stable funding stream, help communities want to invest in it the way communities want to invest in, in, in K to 12. And as we've said, you know, all throughout this call, I think parents are more aware than ever before of the complexity and importance of their child's education. And I think we have an opportunity um, to do something bold right now. So that, that's my dream. Great. Well, thank you to each of our panelists for just a wonderful conversation full of bright ideas and challenging thoughts. Um, we thank you to everyone on YouTube for joining us today. Um, and we invite you to check out a recently released this morning article from the Capita CEO, Joe Waters, um, his column in The Hill today was on how to save childcare. Um, we also want to invite you to our next Capita conversation. We will be chatting with Jason Blakely, who is a professor of political science at Pepperdine University, and that will be on August 27th at 4 p.m. And he'll be talking about his new book, We Built Reality, which was published last month by Oxford University Press. Um, you can find more information about that event and other upcoming events at capitasocial.org backslash events or follow us on Twitter at capita underscore social. So we just thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your day and join us again next time. Thank you. Megan and Joe, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.